بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Welcome everyone to a new event hosted by the King Faisal Center's uh, Asian Studies Unit. Uh, today's event is a particularly special one that is part of an ongoing launch for a special edition in the Third World Quarterly, and uh, which I also had the privilege of contributing an article to. Um, today, we brought an assortment of scholars to introduce some of the key ideas and some of their own key works in this special edition. Um, today we have with us Professor Harry Verhoeven, who is the convener of the Oxford University China Africa Network and an associate member of the Department of Politics and International Relations of the University of Oxford. Uh, he is also the brains behind the special edition, uh, as well as the editor who has worked tirelessly over the past year to collect the papers as well as to produce them in polished form. Uh, we also have with us uh, Dr. Jason Sumich, who is a political anthropologist who studied at the University of California, Santa Barbara, uh, University of Cape Town and London School of Economics. He is currently an associate professor at the University of Essex uh, and has had past experience working at various institutions, including the London School of Economics, the University of Fort Hare, University of Pretoria, um, and many others in the European continent. Uh, we also have with us Dr. Ankita Pandey, who is currently an assistant professor of political science at the Indra pra Prashtra College for Women in the University of Delhi. Uh, she has secured the Commonwealth Scholarship funded by the UK government to undertake doctoral research at the University of Oxford. Uh, we also have with us Dr. Gabriel Siracusano, who obtained his PhD in history uh, at the University of Rome. Uh, he currently collaborates with the Gramsci Foundation in Rome and is the editor of the Italian history magazine, Historia Magistera. Uh, he is also a research fellow at the Scuola Normale Superiore in, in Pisa. Um, today's event will follow the template that we followed in the past, uh, namely uh, that the whole event will be for an hour and 30 minutes. Each, each speaker will be allotted something in the realm of 10 to 12 minutes. Uh, and after that, we will open the floor for questions from the audience. Uh, I encourage the audience, of course, to type their questions in the Q&A uh, below. Uh, and uh, without further ado, uh, Harry, the floor is yours. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Ya Muhammad, and thank you so much for the, for the center for, for hosting us here today. Uh, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you may you may find yourself. It's a Great pleasure to to be here with all of you and to be in the in the presence of some of the, um, the very distinguished colleagues uh, with whom we've been to working together indeed on this special issue for the journal Third World Quarterly. I think in the in the chat indeed there should be a, a link for those of you interested in checking out the the special issue. We have uh, some open access, no paywall uh, for a number of these uh, for a number of these articles. I think for the remainder of the month, so do. Do have a look there if, if it piques your interest uh, what we what we will be telling you here here, here today i'm going to quickly share my um, share my screen and and briefly tell you a bit about the the background to this to this project um, and the reason why we have thought in 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 particular ways about the questions that the special issues is concerned with uh, as well as you as you will have seen the the title of the special issues marx and Lenin in africa and asia socialism socialisms plural and socialist uh, legacies. Now, the, the intellectual starting point of the, of the conversation we've had over the past couple of years is really the events of 1989. Um, now, when I say 1989, for, for many people, they will closely associate this, of course, with the events in Berlin in November 1989, the crossing of the Berlin Wall, of the, of the border that separated East Berlin from, from West Berlin by thousands of, of Berliners, and the associated events in the months and years that came after that, uh, as part of underlying forces, of course, that were already dissolving the Warsaw Pact, um, ending the Cold War by polarity as we, as we knew it, and of course, leading to the reunification of, of Europe. And very much a sense in the mind of many people, policymakers, but also political scientists, social scientists more broadly, uh, that this in many ways marked the end of socialism, or even socialism's plural, as an organized form of political ideology in government. 
Um, since then, it has been largely unfashionable to study socialism or Marxist-Leninism as anything but, as I said, an ideology of, of protest or contestation or some kind of historical relic, but certainly not to assess it in terms of its contemporary relevance. Yet we in the special issue take a rather different view, not just of socialism or socialisms, but also of the geography of thinking about ideology, because of course 1989 is also a very important year for other parts of the world, but very different conclusions were drawn there. The very obvious thing I think to think of is to point what, out what happened, of course, in June 1989 in China, in Beijing, Tiananmen Square in particular, and the very clear choice of the Chinese Communist Party, perhaps the world's most formidable political machine, in favor of democratic centralism as opposed to further political liberalization, as was demanded by the tens of thousands of protesters who had poured into Tiananmen Square in the, in the days and weeks prior to the events, of course, of the, of the 5th of June, uh, 1989. But this is not just the case in Asia, it's also very importantly the case in Africa. It's worth pointing out that 1989, again, that same year in Africa, uh, especially the Horn of Africa was a, was a turning point. Uh, we saw the formation of the Ethiopian People's Revolutionary Democratic Front, the EPRDF, an alliance of several rebel movements, the most important of which were explicitly Marxist-Leninist in orientation, and would continue to be so even after capturing power in 1991, both in Eritrea, which would become a newly independent state, but also in Ethiopia, Africa's most second, second most, populous, most populous country. And this was significant because this formed part of a wider trend of a series of dominoes as if it were, as if it were falling across the continent where you saw the emergence of so-called liberation or neo-liberation movements, many of which at least for public purposes dropped some of the more radical Marxist Leninist language, but in many ways continued to be very strongly informed by socialist categories and socialist ways of thinking, whether indeed in Ethiopia and Eritrea or further afield in places like Uganda, Rwanda, Congo, all the way up to the Atlantic and a place like, like Angola where for a much longer time, a self-declared vanguard had, had, taken, had taken power. And this was also significant, even though it's not part of our special issue, for example, of course, in Latin America, 1989 is also the year of the so-called Caracazo in Caracas in Venezuela, where more than 2000 uh, protesters were, were killed by the officially liberal democratic regime, uh, but where there was really an outpouring uh, of, of anger and frustration on part of the urban proletariat in, in Venezuela. And Hugo Chavez, of course, later the great helmsman of, of Venezuela's socialist experiment, uh, would describe the Caracaso in 1989 as the defining moment in his, his political life, the moment when he realized that socialism or socialisms was not a way of thinking of the past, but would continue to be very important in the 1990s and beyond. And so we, we take these observations that 1989, the end of the Cold War, is experienced very differently by people in Africa and in Asia than it has been in, in Europe or in the West more broadly. And that really is the starting point of our, of our intellectual exercise. And it also led us therefore to revisit a lot of the, the very conventional scholarship on, on socialisms in, in Africa and Asia, of which this quote by, by Barnett Rubin, an Afghanistan expert, I think is entirely representative. And unfortunately it, it, it highlights some of the key problems with, with extant uh, scholarship. Uh, Rubin, describing socialism in Afghanistan, once said that the People's Democratic Party of Afghanistan articulated criticism using poorly understood Marxist terminology. Their Marxism was skimpy and mainly limited to what could be gleaned from translations of a few Marxist classics published by the Iranian Today Party. More important than Marxism as a theory of social change was the role played by the neighboring Soviet Union in supporting the Afghan state and offering to support to export its versions of modernization. The party's analysis of Afghanistan, as set forth in its platform, note the inverted commons, was a more or less canned Soviet line analysis that could just as well or ill have been applied to any one of dozens of post-colonial countries. And this really unfortunately has been the entry point for so much of the thinking and the writing about revolution and about socialisms or Marxist-Leninism in much of the developing world or the non-Western the non, the non world, an idea that ultimately socialism or socialisms there were often merely copy and paste from Western models, that socialism was something that was exported from the West, from Europe, and later from the Soviet Union to the non-Western world, that their theoretical interpretation was impoverished and weak, that socialism was really a vignette or a label, but not something that actually helps us understand or explain social dynamics. 
And that therefore it should not come as a surprise to anyone that after 1989, so many of these places, at least in the imagination of certain analysts, reverted to fundamentalism or ethnic politics or various forms of tribalism in any ways revealing, if you like, the kind of Potemkin nature of socialist experiments, whether in places like Yemen or Burma or uh, Ethiopia or wherever around the, the, the African or Asian continent that you may care to, to look. Now we take a fundamentally different viewpoint. That is to say, we are not here to endorse or reject any form of socialism or Marxist Leninism. What we are here to do is to try to understand and what the special issue tries to do is what it meant from the perspective of the global peripheries to engage with various forms of socialism and to articulate social, political, economic, geopolitical projects of their own in a post-colonial setting. Because we argue that the challenge of a post-colonial state gave very particular characteristics to the various interpretations of socialism, which have in many ways uh, helped confuse or confound the, the Western analysts, the West, Western attempts in many cases at in Eurocentric attempts at coming to grips with what is happening in these societies. And so, so fundamentally, we argue that is what is what is very particular about studying socialism and socialism historically but also today um, in Africa and in Asia, is really that post-colonial states had to wrestle with three big challenges to which for many people at different points in time, uh, some form of socialism seemed to provide a registry of possible answers. The first challenge, of course, um, from almost all of these states is the building up of empirical and judicial statehood of sovereignty. Uh, this is not something to be taken for granted. It often is, again, from a, from a European or North, North American standpoint. But from the standpoint of many African and Asian states, this, the, the building of the state, the, the construction of the administrative grid, the expansion of the ability of different state institutions to penetrate society and actually have its, have its writ run large was really absolutely central. And socialism in many ways provided a potential set of answers to that first challenge. The second challenge is really the challenge of nation building. How in many cases to create some kind of coherent narrative and a narrative of progress at that to bring together and unite the various ethnic, linguistic, religious, cultural groups inhabiting a territory, often, of course, a territory constructed around boundaries set by colonial powers, or at least very strongly shaped by them. Again, the question, therefore, of identity formation, the transformation of class, but also questions about nationhood and personhood uh, were absolutely central. And again, socialism uh, was seen and still seen in certain cases to be providing a number of inspirations or even concrete institutional answers to that question. And thirdly, of course, it's how to operate in an international system not of their making. Uh, almost none of these states had any say in drawing up the rules of the game in international relations. Uh, if it had been up to them, they would probably have designed a very different international system. But they came into that international system at the time of the Cold War, putting very specific set of pressures on them. And again, as we argue in the special issue, that is something that, that, that struggle for autonomy and space to maneuver in the international system is something that continues to shape a whole range of, of experiments and experiences, which we argue are very, are very, very important to take seriously and to study uh, in their own right, on their own terms, uh, as, we, as, we, as we try to do. Again, for us, you know, therefore, the politics of ideas is absolutely central. Um, we don't, again, necessarily approve of these ideas or disapprove, but we try to, to, to take them seriously as a factor, as a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a factor of analysis, as a possible explanation for a series of, of processes we were witnessing in Africa and, and Asia. Um, you know, we don't just see ideas as mere ruses or mere derivatives of money politics. Uh, we believe that ideas must be taken seriously and must be studied in their consequences, however disastrous they may have been. And again, that's what we try to do in a, in a whole series of African and Asian, Asian societies. So just to conclude on, on my side, to give you a very brief overview, you're going to hear from some of our excellent contributors in just a minute uh, to the different cases and, and areas and historical periods they studied. Uh, but some of the other contributions to the special issue include two absolutely outstanding articles on, on Indonesia. One trying to understand the absolute omnipresence of, of socialism in Indonesia before 1965 pretty much every single political party in Indonesia that had some modicum of political support before 1965 was socialist in some shape or form. And so that article tries to understand why that is, why that mattered, 
But then, of course, why the, after the extraordinary violence, genocidal violence of 1965, 1966, socialism vanished almost entirely as a political, as a form of political organization, a form of political ideology. Um, and that is then taken up in the second article, also really, really interesting. And it tries to understand the shift to Islamism. Why is it that so many historical bases, um, including sociological bases of, of, of socialism have reverted and have shifted uh, to becoming such strongholds of various forms of Islamic thinking, Islamist thinking, but also just a broader Islamization of, of society in Indonesian society. So those articles are, are very focused on that. Um, we also have a, a number of articles that deal with um, socialism in very different locations, including, for example, in, in, in Somalia. And it tries to understand the, the state and nation building efforts of the, of the Somali revolution after, 19, after 1969. And the very uneasy interaction that Somalia had with the Soviet Union. On the one hand, the Soviet Union, as for so many uh, countries in the developing world, was, was a guide and was a model that inspired and could provide a modicum of material support. But at the same time, in many ways, the Soviets deeply misunderstood the nature of the societies they were partnering with. There was an extraordinary amount of things lost in translation. They st struggled to take seriously indigenous interpretations, as in Somalia, of what socialism could and could not deliver and what its priorities should be. So we have we have some material on, on that. And then uh, finally, we have a, quite a few articles that deal with the concept of the vanguard party and, and democratic centralism, a very different way of politically organizing your, your society and trying to understand how interactions between Asian and African uh, liberation movements and, and socialists or self-declared Marxist-Leninist parties uh, gave shape to a whole rise, a range of, of political institutions that have, are proving consequential to this, to this day. So I hope that gives you a bit of a sense of, of what we've tried to do. I'm keen, of course, to engage further in the Q&A as to the um, analytical foundations of this project, but now I hand it back to, to Mohammed to, to continue to moderate, but thank you very much. Thank you so much, Harry, for that excellent overview of uh, the, the special edition, sort of the ideas that underlie it, as well as the sort of the thematic focus of the different works. Again, I reiterate uh, Harry's comment. If you look at the chat, uh, you can find a link to the special edition uh, in the Third World Quarterly, and it's for free. So I really encourage you to go through the different articles there. Uh, now I'd like to invite uh, Jason uh, to the floor. Um, first of all, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak with you all today. So as time is short, 10 minutes, um, let's dive right in. Um, my goal for my particular essay within the wider framework of the special issue was to trace the legacy of socialism, what it meant and how this helps us to better understand contemporary politics in Mozambique and maybe what this also speaks to wider post-socialist settings. To do so, I have not only focused on concrete instantiations of socialism, the kind of politics, social forms and practices that were carried out under its banner, but also how its meaning was and is shaped by failures, silences, and the ways in which the present is haunted by an unfulfilled promise. Archambault argued the dominant form of social life in post-socialist Mozambique is a politics of pretense a regime of truth that encourages ambiguation over clarification and dissimulation over revelation and confrontation. To try and explore the legacies of socialism, I built upon Aschenbaugh's argument to analyze the ways in which shifting political forms of pretense and the reactions to them have played a fundamental role in shaping visions of the nation and collective belonging dating back to the late colonial period. I argued that the socialist period, which you could say would be, let's say 1975 to 1990, was in many ways an ambitious attempt to escape the politics of pretense, a utopian effort to give birth to a society where unlike the colonial period, unjust power could and should be confronted and overthrown, where a regime based on truth, a regime of truth based on ambiguity, complicity and dissimulation would be destroyed through the construction of a new collective. In this new, more perfect social order, lived experience would flow from as is, rather than as if it were so, which characterized the colonial period. Central to this effort was the creation of a, a new authentic national subject as the basis from an, for an all-encompassing state. 
Free limo envisioned capitalism and by extension socialism less as a method of production, but more as a moral relationship. The basis for the construction of a socialist society, O homum novo, the new man, was above all a moral subject, hardworking, obedient, rational, one that was uninterested in petty individualism, but instead strives selflessly for the collective. Being a Mozambican then in the revolutionary period was not simply the effect of being born in Mozambique. Rather, it was a moral choice based on willfully renouncing the dark past of imperialism, obscuritanism, patriarchal rural feudalism, and any competing ties of kin, village, region, religion, ethnicity, and class. The conception of a linear timescale where the population would be transformed into a modernist subject whose horizons extended to the nation itself, transcending regional and ethnic identities, the basis of an idea of citizenship, this lingered on after the collapse of socialism and remains potent even for those who have no personal memory of the revolutionary era. However, while a sense of a distinct and overarching Mozambican identity is one of the enduring trumps, triumphs of the socialist period, it is one that is associated with the ruling Free Limo Party, which has been in power since independence in 1977 and is exclusive of wider forms of identification. A prime example is even today in the provinces when a high ranking visit dignitary from the capital is visiting, they will be popularly referred to as Anasawashta Visitando, the nation is visiting. Frilimo maintains its power by combining liberal traits it has adopted since the fall of socialism in 1990 constitutional guarantees, elections, and openness to foreign capital, with previous techniques that developed during the socialist period, as Harry was talking about, such as the interpolation of party, the state, the security forces, and much of the economy into a hierarchical political structure based on democratic centralism. Now, this is the ideal. It doesn't always work the way it's supposed to, but this is the ideal. I mean, we are dealing with a government that hasn't delivered the mail since 1975. So in some cases, this works really well and others, not so. These techniques coupled with Frilimo's authorship of what it means to be a national subject allows the party leadership to monopolize what it is to be a modern Mozambican. However, this monopoly is increasingly fragile. Revolutionary temporality or the conception of time as an evolutionary linear scale through which a supposedly automatized population would be forged into a new collective based on unbreakable moral bonds has collapsed. Under socialism, time was Janus based. On the one hand, it was an ally. The laws of history assured eventual victory. However, time was also a brutally demanding taskmaster that had to be relentlessly struggled against to lead the country out of backwardness. As Stalin famously said, we, must, we are 100 years behind. Either we develop in 10 years or they will crush us. Although the language of development of overcoming the past permeates current political discourse, capitalism is in many ways outside of time. Transformation is now a mere memory and the possibility of radical change is relegated to the past. And people are increasingly bound together by the memory of an epoch that never actually was. From 1977, the party faced a growing military challenge by rebels who were originally trained by white minority ruled Rhodesia, Rhodesia and later funded by apartheid South Africa, but who found a social base amongst those opposed to Frilimo's sometimes heavy handed attempts at social engineering, especially in the center and the north of the country. With the military de situation deteriorating and the nation teetering towards economic collapse, the party's reliance on increasingly harsh forms of coercion grew. A new politics of pretense emerged as socialism deteriorated into set forms and rituals. Loyalty was demonstrated through the public display of officially mandated social forms and behaviors, for example, the famous public rallies where Free Limo earned its nickname, a baishukon, or down with due to the repetitive and almost ritual call and respond chants where the party leaders would call out a baixo com capitalismo, a baixo com obscuritismo, a baixo com imperialismo, down with capitalism, down with obscuritism, down with imperialism. And the crowd would respond, viva Frilimo, long live Frilimo. However, these public rituals were increasingly divorced from private life as growing inequality 
and state breakdown ensured nepotism, economies of favors, pilfering, absenteeism, theft of state property, and the black market along with other forms of corruption were really the only ways to ensure survival. As one woman told me, socialism soon meant the public and mindless mouthing of slogans. One did not think about what they were saying. And in many cases, one wasn't even aware of what they were saying. Furthermore, if one ironically, unironically used the same hackneyed political rhetoric and stock phrases in private, they would have been considered bizarre and pathetic. Um, the eventual abandonment of socialism in 1990, followed by the peace in 1992, were accompanied by a gradual reawakening of a dampened future orientation. In this case, the promise of a far more modest but still noticeably better future. And the end of the war was a dramatic improvement. How their other developments were ominous. Under successive structural adjustment programs, entire industries were abandoned. Thousands of industrial and state jobs were lost and salaries in the nation's largest employer, the bureaucracy, were cut. Those who benefited most visibly were primarily restricted to high-ranking party members, their families, and associates amid profound poverty and deepening inequality. Free Limo itself also became a major economic actor, both through partnerships with multinationals and in its own right, keeping important segments of the economy within the Free Limo family by allowing trusted party members to take control of newly privatized economic concerns. The leadership has invested considerable energy in downplaying down and strategically erasing aspects of the socialist period that would now be in direct contradiction with the current practices of power. However, the official silence is continually undermined by the centrality of the memories of the early independence period and the projects of legitimation which undergird it. Although the party's power and presence has waxed and waned in the capitalist period, Free Limo is still synonymous with the state and its structures are deeply intertwined with security services, the judiciary, the media, and the economy. While allegiance is still demonstrated by adapting valorized social forms and cultural behaviors, unlike previous eras, it's no longer so clear exactly what these are, how they would be put into practice and what they're supposed to mean. Thus, attempts to combine the old and new have caused much confusion, as many cadres are unsure which direction they're supposed to be leading the country, or what exactly the new system is. For example, one mid-level official told me, the major challenge was to change the mentality of the people, something they are slowly getting used to. You see, in socialism, the government gives to the people, and in capitalism, people give to the government. While an official who worked for the party controlled trade unions summed up the contradictions of the capitalist era as follows. When I asked him if the laws favored workers or employers now, he just laughed and replied, that's the thing about the laws, they do not favor anyone. It's like the laws of nature, it favors whoever survives. Socialism in the Indian Ocean and the world more generally was not restricted solely to the techniques of rule, a few political forms. It was principally a moral claim the promise of justice and a better life, the herald of a dawning utopia. In Mozambique, the gradual decoupling of any sort of political project of transformation from this sense of revolutionary temporality that the dawning of a brave new world can happen, it's just around the corner. And we will soon, uh, there is a soon to be realized future that's totally different from the present. This collapse has seriously undermined the moral basis of the free limo's rule. While the colonial period and the late socialist period were mired in a politics of pretense, at least it's clear what the pretense was. Everyone knew what they were supposed to be pretending. Currently, it's increasingly hard to know exactly what one should pretend to be, for whom one should pretend to be so, and how exactly one should do it. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jason. Uh, I'd also like to just remind the audience to write or type out their questions in the Q&A box below uh, and to refrain from using the chat. Um, now I think we'll call on our next speaker, uh, Ankita, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, um, Harry, and uh, thank you, Mama, for this opportunity. Um, um, I, I am traveling, so um, and I'm not in my home Wi-Fi network. So in case, uh, please do alert me in case the video freezes or uh, the network does not hold up. I, I apologize for that. 
Um, so um, my paper in the uh, special issue is titled a left turn to legalism, um, fact finding inquiries as political critique in 1970s India. Um, what I've done in this uh, paper, as well as uh, the, the research, is uh, to look at the practice of voluntary independent fact finding investigations that uh, first generation civil rights activists undertook in India. Um, typically, these are uh, investigations not very different from fact finding as we uh, know from various international human rights uh, contexts. These are investigations that sort of comprise a team of people who come together uh, as a one off exercise. They visit the ground, they note witness testimonies, they inspect the scene of crime if there is any, uh, and they collect evidence. Um, a report is then prepared and published, and typically it tries to uh, name and shame the perpetrators. It uh, uses the testimonies of uh, uh, people as a basis for litigation. It makes recommendation for any, for, to prevent any um, further abuse. Um, and it creates, most importantly, a, a record, a public sort of archival record of governmental abuses of power. So, um, so speaking strategically, what, this, what is at stake is the ability to legitimize, to communicate, and to strategize about facts in the public sphere. Um, in the Indian context, these fact-finding exercises uh, multiplied in the, in the aftermath of two events, really. Um, the first is an armed peasant uprising uh, referred uh, to as the Naxalite movement. This was in the 1960s, mid 1960s. And the second was the imposition of the internal emergency by the then government in the 1970s. Um, and, and what I have done in the paper is to examine the practice of fact finding uh, as a mode of activism and to see what it tells us about the heterodox and varied sort of nature of left political praxis in India. Um, mostly the left is uh, studied in India either in the, either in the anti-state movements, the armed uh, anti-state movements, Maoist um, uh, movements or uh, the the section of the left that has decided to participate in electoral politics, the section of the left that uh, uh, that 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 is part of parliamentary politics uh, in India, and um, so sort of different from both of them. This is a, uh, this is a study of uh, a left sort of activism that operates in the public sphere and uh, runs quite a different path. Um, I argue that the practice of fact finding was a hybrid production uh, of both liberal legalism and left politics. It was a unique strategy that uh, is legalist in its form, but retains a very strong affinity with movements on the, uh, on the far left. Um, just as a, uh, for, for those who may not be familiar, just a very brief sort of introduction of civil rights activism in India, only because I know that most prominently civil rights, the term is actually associated with mass protest movements against racial segregation. Um, in the Indian context, uh, civil rights activism actually comes very close to uh, human rights activism. These are, it's, it's, it's a collective action undertaken voluntarily by a few organizations to secure uh, civil liberties and democratic um, rights. Um, and again, it sort of predates the international human rights uh, moment because it goes back to uh, colonial India. The history of this activism goes back to colonial India in the 19, uh, early 1930s, um, where there were groups that uh, lobbied for rights of Indians as uh, British subjects. They demanded imperial citizenship, the right to form assembly, to association, to organize collective action, um, and to protest, of course, the violations of fundamental liberties of Indians in, the, uh, in, in British India. Um, Post-independence, like I just said, the, the activism really takes on in the wake of the Naxalite movement. Um, and various groups, sort of the independent, non-funded voluntary groups are set up um, by people who um, are sympathizers of the Naxalite movement, though not necessarily in complete agreement with the methods that the movement uses or the leadership of the, uh, of the movement. These members are urban, uh, educated, middle-class uh, middle salaried professionals, um, 
such as you know lawyers and academics and journalists and doctors who uh, like i said are sympathizers of the movement no though not necessarily uh, in agreement with the movement leadership they are uh, they, they they take upon themselves to protest police abuse um, detentions tortures but really most importantly in this decade I, i've looked at the 1970s um in in this decade really about encounter killings um, that are so so cold blooded murders that are passed off as encounter killings um of naxalite prisoners and these prisoners uh, obviously were taken in the counter insurgency operation that uh, happens from the side of the state um what is noteworthy is that uh, there's a very long sort of established global left wing practice of studying uh, social situations of conducting inquiries um often these uh, as as many of us would know these are undertaken to adopt sort of positions on fundamental socio economic questions um marx himself studied situations he analyzed them to apply and develop some of the fundamental some, some of the fundamental thoughts uh, or tenets of its of his thoughts um and socialist and communist groups all over the world uh have set up uh counter inquiry commissions parallel inquiry commissions to challenge uh, official records or to challenge official uh, decisions coming closer home in india socialist ideas actually carry a lot of respectability uh, around the time of independence both in the ruling elite as well as the middle classes um and uh, in the interviews that i conducted with various civil rights activists many actually mentioned a very strong influence of the anti vietnam war uh, protests they had uh, closely followed the international war crimes tribunal um and uh, in the context of the vietnam uh, war so by the time by the 1960s um, um the failings of the indian government had kind of created a a material and human base for um for various social movements to come up and alongside that you have a group of civil society based actors some of them are actually ex naxalites who choose who choose a, a a mode of activism that is born out of sympathy with uh, the goals of the naxalite um movement and i i don't want to sort of um digress into uh, uh the fact but just sort of maybe mention it that of course there's a section of the left that is scoffing at um the bourgeois Uh, methods of of this particular uh, a section but that only speaks about the variegated nature of left uh, in india so i have examined five reports um, uh, all of that all of uh, which were produced in the 1970s and i have noted in the article that there are really two things that are going on if you look at the text of those uh, fact finding reports one is this emphasis on uh, legalizing public memory um converting people's memories into legally acceptable testimonies the teams will systematize systematize they will verify they will um document testimonies in such a way that they become acceptable to a judicial commission or to a court um they will carry these testimonies will carry details such as date and time and location and uh, and the name of the person who's taking the testimony and and verifying it when having a witness and um the 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 works the idea is that the teams are very mindful these fact finding teams are very mindful of the validity of the sources uh, cited and the admissibility of the uh, report in the court of law um the second sort of element that uh, is is a predictable element in these reports is uh, is that that there is a lot of attempt to expose official cover ups um the practice of fact finding the the they invested in locating gaps outlining any inconsistencies exposing um records governmental records that are fudged um or finding inconsistencies within administrative documentation um and all of them sort of raise questions about the motives of the uh, of the police or the local administration uh, in these contexts um so what it really the the membership of these um of of civil rights groups really sort of um uh, validates the fact um as 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 some um uh, scholars in india have noted that a whole generation of political leaders 
left activists, intellectuals, lawyers, journalists, public figures in India, they kind of saw their role uh, uh, as people who had sympathies with the left or identified with some version of socialism, Gandhian socialism, um, left or communist, um, self-identifying as such. Uh, but they saw their role not in destabilizing the political system, but in institutionalizing the radical aspirations of the left within a new, uh, newly made constitution and the law. So uh, in a sense, the left political culture in India is marked by um, its opposition, of course, to unjust law, but also uh, a strategic turn to the law um, without necessarily believing in the normative promise of law, um, and and yet tries to sort of you know reclaim law and and and, and remain uh, adequately legalist in uh, trying to do all of this. Um, and partly, I would say that left legalism is also facilitated, as I have sort of mentioned before, by the heterodox nature of Marxian political thought in modern India. You have um, sort of um, scholars who have called left political culture in India radical liberalism. Uh, that is to say that a significant common feature in various currents of Indian left was a commitment to both class politics, but also to certain core liberal values um, that possibly comes from a post-colonial uh, 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 sort of status. Um, and, and a belief in the law as a social instrument can be seen in the writings of many first generation figures who inspired and led civil rights activism um, in India. Um, left legalism, therefore, in India, I would say, is a form of uh, fact finding that, uh, or, or fact finding is an instance of left legalism in India that exposes the partisan character of law, that uh, that claims the normative promise uh, of law, that extends legal reasoning and strategies outside of the courtroom to the public sphere, and uh, and manages to create an adversarial space within the public sphere in India. Um, and and I'd, I'd like to end by saying that fact-finding reports in India managed to um, air um, the concerns of armed uh, uh, left movements um, well into the 1980s. And that is um, a testimony to their uh, success in intervening in the kind of public sphere that uh, India had. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ankita, for an extremely interesting presentation. Uh, now I'd like to invite uh, Gabriel. The floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, salam alaikum to everyone. And uh, first of all, uh, thank you for inviting me. And thank you to Harry and Mohammed to, for organizing this event. Um, my contribution for the special issue focuses on some of trade union and uh, political training experiences implemented by the World Federation of Trade Union in, uh, in the leftist West African countries, such as uh, Guinea and Mali. And this was promoted by the socialist bloc uh, to, to broad socialism to, to newly independent countries that uh, were receiving economic aid uh, assistance from Soviet Union and uh, Eastern European countries. And the collaboration of the World Federation of Trade Union uh, with the General Workers Union of uh, Black Africa um, in French, uh, Union Générale des Travailleurs d'Afrique Noire, shows the contradictions of the overly orthodox uh, ideological approach of communist trade unionists to the, to the African reality, which is socially different from that of Europe. Uh, for this reason, the role of French and um, Italian communists as uh, mediators between Soviet style socialism and African way to, to socialism is fundamental for the international communist movement in attempting to, to, to structurally transform the um, independent countries of uh, West Africa. However, the resistance of the governments of Tsekuture in Guinea and Modibo Keita in Mali to the dogmas of, the, of orthodox socialism uh, caused 
uh, those experiences to to fail. At the same time, Ture and Keta felt threatened by solid paternalism and uh, wanted to preserve their autocratic power by by strengthening uh, their governing parties and uh, weakening outside the influences. However, the different attitudes of French and Italian communists compared to the Soviets' uh, favorite, their dialogue with the Guineans and, uh, and Malians, and uh, Western communists also seek to promote the development of socialism in Africa, but with different goals and strategies. Uh, their intent was to strengthen the socialist camp, uh, but, with, but uh, their um, autonomous action developed uh, uh, from political ties prior to independence, in the case of the, the French Communist Party, or in function of the elaboration of an uh, original communist political culture, and this is the case of the, the, PC, the PCI, the Italian Communist Party. And the Italian communists focus on elaborating their own national path uh, to socialism, a national way to socialism, uh, that aims to build a, a, a socialist society uh, following the needs and condition of Italian society. And the Italian Communist Party uses uh, the same type uh, of analysis for the development of socialism in African societies seeking a dialogue with the peasants, uh, traders, and um, civil workers uh, service, and uh, administrative workers. According to Italian communists, the only way to, to, to show the, the rightness of socialist choice to the Africans is, is, is to respect the local condition and the local traditions. Um, the socialist bloc will uh, only uh, expand uh, and strengthen in in this way, in, the, in this in this in this vision, in this perspective. Conversely, French communists want to form a conscious African working class vanguard through political and union training. This new working class should be tasked with a leading a socialist revolution that will transform the independent countries and lead them to to, to socialism. They want to educate uh, trade union and political uh, leadership um, according to Marxist-Leninist uh, orthodoxy, but taking into account a cultural link of the former French colonies with the metropolis, with, the, with France. Uh, French and Italian communists are at the top uh, of the World Federation of Trade Union, and assume important roles in the founding uh, of an African Workers University in, in Conakry. And this is a fundamental for the spread of socialist ideas and as a vector for the expansion, <coughs> expansion of socialism in West Africa. The di direction um, of this institution is um, entrust to a French communist lead. This is a leader of a, is a, a member of uh, the CGT, the uh, trade union, the French trade union uh, linked to the Communist Party. Uh, this is Maurice Gasteau. Uh, and French communists uh, immediately become hegemonic within the institution, uh, within this institution. And um, this ends up giving the university didactics and orthodox uh, slant. Uh, for the French communists, it is necessary to, to form a, a revolutionary work as vanguard um, ideologically and um, culturally, according to canons typical of the French Marxist tradition. This would uh, avoid <coughs> the expansion uh, of a pro-Chinese heretical socialism and leads to a more rigidly uh, orthodox approach to political and ideological training, which takes little account of the of the social condition of uh, independent African countries. <clears throat> uh, courses include lect lectures on the history of Africa, on the history of Europe, on the history of the uh, communist movement, and and uh, about trade unions <clears throat> with an uh, historicist uh, stadium approach. 
as well as uh, lectures on workers' rights and uh, Marxist uh, social economic doctrine. Italians contribute to the political formation of peace and unions and forge important relationship uh, with the Guinean, uh, Malian and Senegalese trade unionists and political uh, leaders outside the workers' university in Conakry. But the French, uh, French uh, uh, the Soviet and the uh, East German or Czechoslovakian trainers are too prone uh, to, to the ortho orthodoxy. And this is not accepted by Secuture, who condemns Soviet uh, meddling in uh, Guinean internal affairs. Uh, the African Workers University in Conakry is not the only experiment in training political and union cadres in a socialist sense. Uh, the Union Générale des Travailleurs du Mali, the, the trade, Malian trade union, uh, asks for help from the World Federation of Trade Union to establish um, a trade union school in Bamako, uh, the capital of Mali, uh, which is directed by, by Gilbert Julie. Another, another member of CGT, of French CGT. Julie realizes here that an effort is needed to politicize the peasants, uh, and that is not possible to refer to ideological canons that are too tied to the industrialized world. Um, Julie want to, wants to prevent the union from, uh, from becoming a, a workers' vanguard isolated from the rest of the country. But this project has little success because of the Malian Union's submission of the country's governing party, um, the, the Union Sudanese, uh, is the name of the governing party. Uh, in fact, this party is shaken by internal struggles between um, a Marxist left and a liberal right, and both these currents want to control the Union School. On the other hand, uh, the government uh, in Bamago is getting closer and closer to Maoism, and Julie's ideological work becomes uh, increasingly complicated, and the school eventually has to close it, its doors in uh, 1967. The rise and decline of union schools in West Africa shows the importance of ideology and uh, an uh, idea of society for state building and uh, an uh, attempt to expand socialism. Uh, Soviet way or, or uh, European uh, idea of socialism on the continent, on the African continent, a ideology that uh, does becomes a useful element for the entrenchment of the great powers in post-colonial states, but also an element of misunderstanding that must be studied if we want to understand the relations between the socialist bloc and Africa uh, which are not limited to the economic sphere or military sphere. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gabrielle. I think all of the presentations sort of showcase very well the considerable diversity of perspectives uh, uh, that is encapsulated in, in, in this special edition. I mean, and it also try, shows really the attempt to highlight sort of unorthodox vantage points of thinking about socialism and the legacies of socialism in sort of the Afro-Asiatic world. So we have a paper that, you know, considers how socialist state building endures even in the post-socialist uh, present in the case of Mozambique. Uh, we have another paper that thinks of sort of leftist legacies in the context of legal culture, right? and also sort of the use of different instruments and tools. I mean, as Ankita was talking, I was really thinking of Mao in the late 1920s going and conducting uh, very detailed reports on the peasantry, uh, you know, sort of these different types of tool sets that are utilized by the left for different ventures and different projects. And of course, in terms of Gabrielle, I think that the, the perspective of looking at trade unions is quite fresh because it looks beyond sort of the traditional rubrics of the state or even party organizations. Uh, and I think there's actually a lot of work to be done in that also for organizations like world peace committees uh, and other sort of international entities that have actually become um, landscapes for intense ideological conflict, which he also effectively highlighted in his paper as well as in his presentation, not just between the Soviet Union on the one hand 
and Maoist China and the other, but also with different visions of Eurocommunism. Um, and I think the unifying strand also, the biggest emphasis is that there's a lot of idiosyncrasy in terms of how different individuals, organizations and groups interpret the Marxist canon. Um, and that sort of is also by, uh, refracted through local conditions. Um, okay, now I think we uh, have something in the realm of 15 to 20 minutes for questions. Uh, we can also extend it for another 15 minutes if uh, there are any follow-ups. We already have two uh, that have lined up. I also invite people who are interested to um, uh, type up any further questions in the Q&A box. Um, so the first question uh, is from Professor Amidou Sani. Uh, and I think this is actually directed to Jason. Uh, Mozambique's communist past since Samora Marcel continues to haunt it since 1975, uh, in spite of the half-hearted liberal democracy. Uh, is there any hope of positive development under capitalism towards which the country is moving? Um, thanks. That's an interesting, if rather difficult question to answer. Um, what is very interesting is the way in some ways, I mean, first of all, we've conflated liberal democracy and capitalism. Those are, those are interesting things, especially in the case of Mozambique, where democracy was imposed on the country after a referendum to make it democratic failed but the only way to get continued aid money was to adopt democratic forms. Um, but what's in, most interesting to me here is the way that the question about Mozambique's movement under capitalism kind of replicates Samora Michel's own categories, as in some sort of unified Mozambique, which of course there isn't. Um, there's positive developments for some Mozambicans. Some have become obscenely rich. Many others have become obscenely poor. Um, and what exactly is capitalism in this sense? Because Mozambican capitalism, I guess, is as idiosyncratic as with almost every other place on earth in comparison to what Adam Smith was talking about as Mozambican Marxism was idiosyncratic compared to what Karl Marx was talking about. Um, but I guess probably not would be my answer. If a movement dedicated towards social justice resulted in this, a movement that's specifically dedicated with no concern of social justice is very unlikely to be a positive development. If an authoritarian but semi, if imperfectly accountable state fails to deliver for its people, it's hard to see how an authoritarian, completely un unaccountable set of corporate actors would somehow step in and deliver progress and plenty in that space. I guess the real question is the, the difficulty of being stuck in this binary, which in many cases is a rock and a hard place position. Um, in many cases, what capitalism, if that's what we're calling it, has done is recreated many of the conditions that led to the liberation struggle in the first place with a different set of rulers this time who um, are not so obviously Portuguese, if that answers the question. Thank you. Uh, maybe we can jump to the second question, which is actually quite broad. And I, I would be interested in hearing maybe the perspectives from various different presenters on it. Uh, but I think it builds on Harry's initial comments, which is uh, from the first presenter, the three challenges cited are quite in place, correct. A part of the challenge was to build a strong national defense against the reemergence of neocolonialism. Um, I guess here it's more like, however, we should remember that freedom independence movements were supported in many aspects by the Soviet Union uh, and her satellites, uh, Cuba and China, which I think, you know, the leaderships in those countries would contest this description considerably. Um, but I guess here there is a tension between sort of the desire to preempt neo-colonialism or subjugation once more with the connections between these different liberation movements with the major powers of the socialist camp. Um, I'm wondering if 
you see these that this tension exists or yeah well thank you so much for that question i think i think it's a good point because this is one of the the central themes of the of the special issue i mean gabriel's paper speaks perhaps most explicitly to this from the ones we have here uh, but the question of the relationship with the with the Soviet Union or even with, with, with China indeed is a complex one. On the one hand, um, I think it's very true to highlight the importance, of course, certainly in the early period, uh, for example, after African independence starting in the, in the 50s and then especially after 1960, where there are these fe fears indeed about um, neocolonialism or a kind of colonial reconquista, not all of which was equally hypothetical. I mean, for example, what happened in Congo with the Congo crisis in particular, was experienced by many in East Africa and West Africa and in Central Africa indeed as a potentially extremely dangerous dangerous development, one that indeed could see uh, federal systems as they were set up being used as launch pads indeed for some kind of colonial or neo-colonial restoration. And indeed outside help for that was, was solicited uh, from various actors, including of course the Soviet Union. Uh, but as we highlight, of course, that, that relationship was, was very difficult for for multiple reasons. I mean, there were some of the, the ideological tensions that and, and uh, Gabriel has, has already talked about, um, different use of, of categories, different interpretations of, of what ideology actually was and who it would serve and how much leeway, of course, local and, and regional authorities and ways of thinking would be allowed to have. Um, and at the same time, of course, being, being often a necessary resource in a context of extreme scarcity and a very difficult decisions to take for certain Asian or in this case, uh, African states. So that, 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 that tension is indeed something we, we explore. And of course, um, we see a range of, of, of different outcomes and, and results in a number of cases, indeed, self-declared socialist regimes that want to have nothing to do with the Soviet Union or even with China that decided that actually for them it is better to formulate um, African or Asian responses in autonomy. In other cases, of course, the decision is taken that uh, for all the tensions and the misunderstandings, that relationship still yields more than it actually requires the, the local partners to, to sacrifice. In any case, what all of them, what all of them contribute to is, is this broader thinking about, the, about socialism as not just constituted by the experiences from the Soviet Union and, and, and Europe to which outside actors respond, but as the global periphery is contributing in equal measure and in many ways being far more representative of what socialism or socialism as experiences have been and as repertoires have been, uh, than necessarily indeed the, 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 the orthodoxy of the, of the so-called core. So I, I hope that it helps to unpack that a bit. Again, you know, Gabriel's paper speaks most explicitly about it, but of course, Jason and Ankita may have, may have thoughts of their own because of course, Mozambique and India itself were very interesting in, in the international system. Um, first of all, I, I don't think it's right to define China and Cuba as satellites of the USSR. Uh, but uh, on this topic, about this topic, uh, for uh, about my research, uh, I, have to, I have to say that uh, socialism, um, Secuture socialism, Guinean socialism was based was based on on another another idea uh, of the of the, of the power uh, that that there was a, an access uh, um, was based on an access to power for the entire population. Uh, this is uh, through through the party and uh, overcoming class, class divisions. Um, the construction of a socialist state, uh, according to, to, to the Guinean leader, according to Secuture, had to take place uh, um, according to local social conditions and the dogmas of communist orthodoxy were, were not acceptable. So Soviet Union, uh, there is an is aversion to trade union training economy and Soviet Union uh, link link um, with the trade union uh, school in Conakry uh, was not just the result of the ideological differences. Um, in fact, Secretary uh, welcomed first welcomed the, the union school uh, because it accompanied the financial and technical uh, assistance of the of Soviet Union and socialist bloc, and this is true, 
which was vital to, to Guinea, uh, but when he realizes that, that Soviet aid is not enough and uh, is often um, inadequate, um, today wants to, to turn to, to the West Bloc and also for this reason uh, want to openly, openly side with the, the socialist bloc and so there is also um, there was also um, uh, a reason uh, a practical reason uh, in addition he does not he doesn't want a revolutionary vanguard of marxist type to to, to form because he's afraid uh, uh, that this could uh, undermine his uh, unchallenged power. Um, they obvious, obviously, this type of vanguard is also not understood by Guinean or Malian workers because uh, it's not much more focused on the working class than on peasants or small traders uh, or, um, and does, uh, doesn't reflect the real uh, African society. And, and this is also the case of Mali uh well the success of the union school um is complicated by internal struggles uh, uh, within the governing party and um once uh, on on one side is the party's right wing which pushes for the dialogue with france and the west and wants to 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 shed its ties to the socialist bloc and um, on the other hand uh there is a um, the extreme left linked to the maoist who Ch maoist uh, so china was uh, wasn't a satellite of the U ussr but was the the opposite in this vision and um and thus the school leans solely on the on the center of the party uh, which wants to maintain a dialogue with the both Soviet Union and the non-aligned movement and China and and also the West. Um, it, it's, it's not not coincidence that the school uh, closed its doors in 1967, uh, uh, which is the year uh, um, which Mobido Kekta chose a line inspired by by Maoist. Uh, cultural revolution proclaiming the so-called active revolution so it is complicated um the assistance of soviet union in africa um i i think it's, it's we can't uh, we can't uh, study the the socialist assistance uh, like a, um, a joint assistance of all socialist country and there is different way uh, different ideologies, different uh, way to assist uh, uh, African countries and uh, different goals also. Thank you, Gabriel. Um, actually, I should have mentioned, uh, you know, very quickly that the question came from Brahima Kaba. Um, Ankita, uh, Jason, if you have any uh, responses to this question. Yeah, I'll just contribute my two cents. Uh, it's not something that I have uh, uh, investigated thoroughly, the relationship of uh, civil rights groups with um, uh, the Soviet Union in particular. I will say that uh, uh, like many left uh, groups, uh, civil rights groups in India are also, uh, there's, there's a lot of factionalism and splits and, you know, predictably, uh, uh, following the predictable pattern, uh, but but one of the sort of reasons for a dispute that eventually led to a, a split is that a section of the activists in the uh, in in one of the civil rights groups uh, lead a protest march in uh, New Delhi against the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. So um, so that so so one group that is slightly more pro. Uh, Soviet Union is very uh, is disappointed and angry at the fact that this protest march uh, had been led, but it's really something that I should sort of look into uh, more. Um, more generally, on the question of freedom uh, movement, I'd say that uh, fact finding in India is actually, like I mentioned, it's part of the anti-colonial movement, but it's part of the toolkit of um, of anti-colonial movement, and it interestingly, it's like it's a little bit like the Olympic. Uh, torch that sort of moves in a relay from 
one person to uh, another. So it's the nationalists that really begin with these counter, uh, uh, you know, parallel investigations and counter investigations, um, uh, often parallel to investigations that the British government had set in, uh, had set up. And then it moves to sort of uh, after independence to parties of the opposition and finally to the sphere of civil society and moves outside of parliamentary uh, or nationalist politics altogether and, and, and the sort of left adopts it and then gives it a completely different uh, shape and color. So it kind of has a as a legacy in the in the freedom movement. Jason, with you. Um, yeah, well, it, it, it's a very difficult question that I think depends on quite a few local circumstances. Um, in Mozambique, the primary fear was Rhodesia and South Africa. And I don't know if you would call that neo-colonialism because they weren't the colonial power in the first place. Um, also, what it means to be a satellite is a very, very difficult question. Um, Mozambique was very good at combining, but was one of the few that combined both China and Russia and the Soviet Union. At the same time, everyone played everyone off against each other. No one was entirely sure of what exactly they wanted at any given time. No, was there ever necessarily one concrete policy? The Soviet Union wants this and defends that. Um, the Soviet Union wanted to cut Mozambique off until the general died of an unexpected heart attack. The Mozambican delegation was invited to the funeral and they told his successor that the general agreed to fund all of their weapons purchases, hence continued Soviet aid. Um, and that was just inspired lying. Um, so what exactly, instead, I think that's, well, in some cases I do see your point. I think it's a bit too linear when you're looking at various nationalist intellectual currents that build off a wide, as Gabriel, Gabriella was saying, off a wide variety of things, from the formal colonial past to left-wing currents to Franz Fanon, to the experience of, so, of the Soviet Union, and to the idea that a small but dedicated authoritarian elite can modernize their country, dragging it kicking and screaming into the 20th century with enough willpower and force. That was probably the most influential aspect as opposed to the Soviet Union and what they officially said so far. It was more of an idea, this is how you can cut history off at the pass. And in many cases, it depends on the era. By 1975, Brezhnev was not the revolutionary exemplar that Stalin was. Um, Mao, on the other hand, looked a lot more attractive at that period if you were 26 and a revolutionary. So um, yeah, it's there's a wide variety of currents that come to play. And while I can see your point, I think it has to be nuanced. I fully agree with that assessment. I mean, although I would say that there are certain leftist streams that have adopted that viewpoint and have accepted the existence of this tension. That is to say um, that the Soviet Union particularly constituted a source of threat for a type of new imperialism, uh, especially through its manipulation and exercised influence on compradors and other elites who would then sort of give up the country's political economic uh, wealth in service of Soviet interests. So this is a tendency we see repeatedly in the context of the Communist Party of China, right? So during the Ya'an period, uh, we see these purges and pushing away of people who had been educated in Moscow. The assumption being is that they would uh, be conduits for Soviet influence uh, that was wanted, but also wanted with uh, certain controls and a degree of autonomy for the party. And in the 1960s, we see, of course, the, uh, the slogan, the very key slogan of that era from China, which is bring down American imperialism on the one hand, and then Soviet revisionism or uh, socialist imperialism. And they were, of course, forwarding this type of tension to much of the Afro-Asiatic world. Um, so these are things also sort of to take into consideration in this discussion. Maybe uh, if, I, if, if I may, yep. one thing perhaps to very quickly draw attention to, so is that in the special issue, it's important to point out that for us, this is not just a historical discussion. It's not just a, an issue going back to the 
to the Cold War, I think one of the important things we point out, and it's exactly where, where various forms of socialism in, the, in Africa and Asia are, let's say, different from the, the, Euro, the, the, the European uh, reality or the European experience, um, is that the influence doesn't stop in 1989, so that many of the ties that were forged um, between countries that, that professed to be socialist and movements that professed to endured and took on different shape. And of course, in, in the neoliberal decades of the 1990s and early 2000s, perhaps some of the more um, confrontational rhetoric had to be dropped. But that doesn't mean, of course, that the categories of analyses, the ways of thinking, um, and the instincts um, have not very much been set. And that's, again, something that the, that the special issue points out is don't stop your analysis again in, in 1989, thinking this was just a, a question of, of the Cold War. What we're trying to say is essentially that the Cold War, of course, mattered hugely to Asia and Africa, but that's not all that there was to their international relations and even to the international relations of socialism. And I think, I think that that's, a, I just want to get that in because again, that's, I think where we try to bring an innovative element to the, to the conversation as opposed to just a, a historical discussion about the, about bi bi bipolarity. Yeah, yeah, no, I fully agree. I mean, even just talking about China, the whole revival of Marxism and the state's continued emphasis on a cinified Marxism as the key to China's current political economic success, I think is really also touches on this, the notion that they've taken an independent road from the Soviet Union or other socialist experiences looms large. Um, I think we've sort of reached the, the, the end of our time for this event. Uh, I'd like to reiterate my thanks on behalf of the King Faisal Center uh, for all of you for coming and joining us and sharing uh, with us your fascinating research. Um, I also encourage the audience that had come here today with us to visit the link that we've posted uh, at the very beginning uh, and to uh, give a look of uh, much of the material that has been produced and also keep an eye on other events that will be hosted by other institutions uh, focusing on the Third World Quarterly Special Edition. Uh, again, thank you so much. And um, if you have any final comments, Harry. Yeah, I was just going to say indeed on, on Mohammed's last note uh, about future events. So we, the next uh, event that's upcoming, I think, is in hosted by North Carolina on the 19th of April, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, which indeed will feature a number of other papers and which will have a bit of a different focus thematically than, than this discussion. So if people uh, were so impressed by us, uh, by our collective here here today and our joint efforts, please please join us then too in turn some of the, the other perspectives, including, of course, Mohammed himself uh, giving his, uh, presenting his paper. So the thanks again for, for hosting us. I, I much enjoyed it and hope it was the same for, for everyone else. Definitely. Yes, thank you. Thank you. All right.